Welcome, everybody. This is Tuesday Morning Grind, episode number 46. Today we have Jewel Hefner with us. Jewel's been, been a colleague of mine for, what, three, four years now? She is a GRC and security expert. She uh, has a lot of experience building teams and working in compliance, uh, very complex compliance and security environments. So, Jewel, I'm excited to have you today. Thank you. Oh, thanks for having me. So, Joel, you have one of the coolest backgrounds in terms of just like working with complex security and compliance backgrounds. Um, but even thinking about it, I actually don't know how you got here. So how did you even get into security and kind of to a place where you're managing a program like this? Sometimes I wonder how I got here myself. Um, <laughs> I kind of fell into the role. I was in a data entry role that I was largely unsatisfied with. I had a very analytical mind and I asked my management a lot of questions. And so I had an opportunity to move into IT and to manage their administrative type stuff. So I was ordering printer cartridges and uh, doing supply checks, things of that nature. We started to go public and they're like, you know what? You're organized. Why don't you do change management for us? I'm like, oh, okay. I don't know what that is, but let's do it. So uh, a lot of self-study, just diving into whatever resources I could get my hands on, spending a lot of time with the auditors that we had and the consultants that we had, absorbing anything and everything I could, and became the change uh, coordinator there and ultimately the compliance specialist and liaison between the Sarbanes-Oxley auditors and IT doing the translations for them. And I kind of fell into security from there. I just kind of grew and was able to expand that knowledge and become an actual IT auditor and dove deeper into security and my educational background and things like that. So just kind of dominate. Just there. came up. Yeah. One opportunity after another. I love talking to, I feel like that's not an uncommon journey to security, which is you just demonstrated a lot of competence. Then you get pulled into audit because you're confident and then you get pulled into the security world. So I, I kind of wanted to start there because You've had, a, I would say, a non-traditional path into security, like m many of us have. And a lot of the questions that I get from folks, especially new people, is how to get into security. So if you're if you're giving someone advice that's like out of college or, or not even in college, and they're trying to get into security in some non-traditional way, like how are you thinking about that? How, how do you get into security or compliance? I don't think there's any one path that leads to security and or compliance. I tell a lot of people that uh, ask that similar question that you can't major in compliance, especially in, in co any college program. Uh, you develop that skill and you kind of grow into it from other areas. But um, I think, you know, starting at the basics is, is important uh, because security, a lot of time we forget the, the basics. We think we have to be the ethical hacker. We have to be the one that's chasing the bad guys in the background. And there's so many different faucets in security that there's no one avenue that uh, you need to take. Yeah, there's like the GRC route, which that, to me, that's the most untapped one that has, as you know, like you can't fill the positions. There's just too many of them. But when most folks are thinking about security, they're not thinking about, you know, managing the audit or governance risk and compliance or, or being an auditor themselves. They're typically thinking about either network operations center, security operations center, ethical hacking or something like that. But there's this whole non-technical, uh, non-technology technical, very compliance technical realm. Um, so you're a hiring manager. Like if someone's non-traditional, like I think we're becoming more and more accepting of not necessarily needing to be a traditional college grad or, or big security firm background to be able to enter the space. So when you're reviewing resumes, what kind of stuff are you looking for if they're non-traditional? Is there is there certain backgrounds you've seen be successful? There's a wide variety of, of backgrounds I've seen be successful in this space, uh, and I'm a perfect example of that. I don't have a non I have a non-traditional background. I only have two associate's degrees. I do not have my bachelor's or my master's or even my doctorate, which you sometimes see on some of these um, yeah job postings, but. I've seen various people be successful. To me, it's it's what's in between the lines of those educational spaces. What have they done? What kind of skill sets do they bring to the table? Because a lot of the things I can teach, like I said, compliance is not something you can um, or audit that you can major in in collegiate background. Um, I've seen some of the 
big auditors come from a financial background and were successful in audit, but never understood the technology side. Um, so some of the skills yep. that I've seen that have become the most successful is those that like to continuously learn, like to um, get their hands dirty and just keep learning, keep pushing and keep being inquisitive and asking the questions. But why? Why, why are you doing it that way? Mm-hmm. And because if you can learn the basics in, in governance, risk, compliance, those basic things that we often forget in security when we go to the complexities and we can get lost in the complexities, those basic things are, are really what get us, gets us the furthest along. Things like access management, doing user access reviews, mm-hmm. you know, those basic elements that we sometimes forget and getting people to remain curious and keep asking questions is really the skill set that I've seen be the most successful. Yeah, I would say in security too, there's this like thing that's hard to interview for, which is diligence and preparedness, you know, and, that, and that's not just security. That could be any position, but the people I've seen do really well well in, uh, in the compliance space and the, and the very sec- technical security space is just people who are hyper prepared, self-study, Probably like a lot of people have portfolios and just uh, very diligent. And I don't know how to interview for that. I still haven't cracked that puzzle. But like sometimes, you know, it when you see it, it's like art, like this person's mm-hmm. or, you know, it from their email exchange, like they're always quick. They're always on point. They're anticipating next steps. And so, some of those things, if I think back on any non-traditional candidates that we've ever hired, were early indicators that they were going to be a really good team member. Uh, we also have this thing called a. Uh, we have a blog post on this and it reminds me of it. We have this thing called GWC core values. I don't know if we've ever talked about that, Joel, where we have uh, basically uh, a point system, get it, want it, capacity to do it. That's GWC and our core values. We have five core values and there's a total of eight categories there. Score each candidate from zero to three after the interview across those. They have to get at least a 16 uh, to, to get a job offer. Uh, and they can't have any zeros. And sometimes over the course of those conversations, when you're like, do they really get it or do they really want it? Or, you know, or do they meet the core values? You start uncovering some of those intangibles that are, are really hard to measure otherwise. So I like doing that. Do you guys do anything special? Like what, what y'all's interviews look like? Are they largely behavioral or the most recent, a mix of technical? Yeah, the most recent team expansion I had and in, in the hiring cycle that I went through, I think it's important to have a diverse committee. So I did the initial interviews and and indicated whether I thought this person should go on to the panel. And then they interviewed with people on the team. They interviewed with key stakeholders, even uh, from a technology standpoint, I had engineers interview them. And Mm -hmm. because it's important that they can speak not only the language within your team, but that they can communicate well and be accepted by your key stakeholders that they're going to be dealing with day in, day out. And then I have them present a presentation. I give them a prompt. And that kind of tells me a a lot of different things, how well they think on their feet. Um, They only get maybe a day, day and a half preparation to to give the presentation. Uh, But they have a choice of several prompts. And then we ask them, based on how they did their presentation, we have real live interviews. I can see how how well they think on their feet. That's awesome. How... um... Who all do they present to on your team? Is it like your core team or is it also engineers? How many folks are they presenting in front of? Whoever is on the um, committee to do the interviews sits in the presentation. So the engineers that participated would sit in on the on the presentation as well as myself and the other core team members. That's that's really cool. I, I haven't done anything like that before, but that's a great idea. I know that when the last job opening that we had, well, heck, we're always hiring. But uh, the last time I posted one on LinkedIn, we uh, we don't always do this, but sometimes we'll do a traditional glass door LinkedIn. Hey, we have a job opening. And uh, it was for a pen test candidate. And we had over 300 applicants. Wow. For And we're not a big company, you know, it's like Risk360. Like, it's not IBM. Like everybody in the world hasn't heard of Risk360. So I couldn't believe that we got that many applicants for it. And then our recruiter you know, basically uh, comb through resumes. So here's a tip for you guys out there. Basically, any we, we shortlisted almost any resume that looked unique because it was just like creativity. It was like, okay, well, that one stands out. And then uh, did some keywords. Mm-hmm. 
pulled them out there. We were looking for things like how long were they at companies. But when you're going through 300, it's so hard to identify high potential candidates that might just not look good on paper. So some of the ways we were doing that was looking for tenure and things like that. So even if someone was non-traditional but had a lot of tenure, we're like, okay, well, they got some stick to Let's check them out. Um, and then we got and then we got the the folks in the interview and did our typical interview methodology. But what I haven't cracked is how do you uh, how do you shortlist candidates that are non-traditional from a stack of resumes? And what I found is if you're a non-traditional candidate and you know that, don't go through the traditional interview process. Like reach out to folks, network, get a mentor, try to get a personal introduction. And, uh, and, and, and those always do really well, uh, the non-traditional candidates that like have a network and they're getting intros and stuff like that. But the resume thing's tough. That was a, golly, that was an ar- arduous process. It really is. And, you know, depending on the time in the market, depending on the position that you're recruiting for, you know, you can yep. get two resumes and the job opening be open for months and then you can have it open 24 hours and you get overloaded kind of like in your case. For um, sure. Ours is the pen testing. Everybody yeah. wants to be a pen tester. So we got all sorts of folks applying because, you know, you think it's like a guy in a hoodie back there and you, you don't realize exactly what that job looks like. But that's it's always what people think of in, in, in pen testing or ethical hacking um, is yep. somebody in the garage. You know, they don't have a live um, sitting around in a hoodie. Um, yep. But uh it's, it's interesting because, you know, trying to make sure that I, I'm really big on unconscious bias. Uh, that, that stays at the forefront of, of my mind. And so I've actually uh, spoken with uh, my various HR um, contacts and, and asked them to remove the name from the resume. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. And instead give it a number and I'm able to kind of remove myself and not give some unconscious bias on a resume. And so I look for those things, exactly what you said, the things that stick out, um, whether it's the formatting, sometimes it's misspellings and those get in a different set. Yep. Um, yep. So don't overlook the details. People that pay attention to the details is actually what you're looking for. And misspellings, things of that nature are, are easy to put into a different pile. Yeah. And- we, we actually have a client that de-identifies resumes. You mentioned unconscious bias. They, uh, they, uh, They'll like remove location. They'll remove um, names, of course, and like uh, there's a bunch of other apparently like gender and ethnic background indicators, and they'll purposely remove those. I, me being um, not a, a hiring manager very often, uh, it, I didn't even realize that that was like a, a service you could get from someone, a de identification yeah. thing, which I thought was really cool. I found it to be really useful because, you know, whether we mean to or not, um, we can do that. And being a female in the tech industry and, and in mm. this um, particular field, I'm often at a disadvantage uh, because of unconscious bias. And so I try to make sure that I don't put others at a disadvantage uh, unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about building a team. So um, you're, you're interesting because uh, your particular job, you, you guys have a lot of different compliance frameworks you have to manage all at once. And that's, I think a lot of companies, especially any larger companies, can empathize with that. So you have this environment where you're doing SOC 2 and PCI and ISO and ABC and EFG. And there's just like so many different ones. Uh, and then you know, and then other companies might have different business units and different locations. And it just gets really, really complicated. So structuring a team around that um, is a little bit of an art, I guess I could say. There's no playbook. There's no one telling you how to structure a security or compliance program to manage all that. And uh, so what was your logic? Like when you're going through that, you're thinking about all the stakeholders, like how are you thinking about building teams and org structure in your compliance environment? With multiple frameworks in play, I really look for people that have some strengths in my core frameworks that we are managing. And then I look for that to play off the weaknesses of others. So I may see people that have a strong background in SOC 2, but not ISO. And another one is vice versa. And to me, that, that tells me that I one can pull someone in that's very familiar with a framework and can hit the ground running fairly quickly because they understand those basics. They've worked within that framework um, for quite some time. And then I've got another candidate that has it, and that shows me career, I can allow career depth, uh, which is also important for me to build a team. Mm-hmm. I don't like to put paint people into a corner. Just because you've done it for five years, you might not want to do it for another five. 
And mm-hmm. so I really look for that balancing act of the background and, and what they do and don't have and try to balance that with someone that's uh, kind of opposite of them. And then, of course, I look for people that have grown throughout their career. And that tells me that they they have that curious mindset and they want to to grow and expand into other frameworks because we really have to think on our feet with the complexities that we have. Yeah. So one thing that we've been like our, our team's growing, we're like 40 people now, which is weird for me because it's like I would say probably around 15 or 20 people is when I personally lost any kind of span of control. Like that became the point where I didn't know what everyone was working on and there were sub teams. And now that we're, you know, 40 plus, that's uh, those days are over, needless to say. So what I realized is like now I'm training the trainer. Like my new job is to help the managers be really good managers. So we're, we're big on we have rolled out this thing uh, that, that I call the management operating system, meaning every manager needs a certain set of tools to be able to do a good job managing their team. Some of those things would include uh, what's your meeting rhythm? What, what tools are you going to use? Uh, how are you going to, what's your training program for anybody new to your team that joins those types of things. So when I talk to good managers like you, I always want to see what you're doing. So can you talk about meeting rhythms, like in the weeds tactical, being a good, good manager, like how often do you have like a set of standing meetings that exist for your team and what do they look like? We do. Um, I have a Monday morning staff meeting, which I call Manic Mondays. Um, <laughs> and ours is uh, so creatively called the weekly tactical meeting. There you go. Maybe I need to, <laughs> I need to just be more creative. <laughs> I'm I'm big on quirky names, things that uh, make you uh, chuckle or, or think twice about uh, the naming schema. So uh, we have Manic Mondays, and that's just our, our quick sync of, you know, what's ahead of us in the week, what blockers may you have that I need to put my attention towards? Do you know your prioritization of your task list? Do I need to help you? Mm-hmm. Um, is that a, is that a full uh, team meeting? Like your whole, all of your staff? Okay, cool. It Got is. It. Um, you know, do you, does one need help? Another has capacity to pitch in, some things like that. So we, we just plan our week and we've used tools such as Trello, uh, OneNote. We, we've kind of... Ver- have a variety of things we've used in the past. And mm-hmm. um, I really just go with what works best for the teams. It's important, I think, to learn what their learning style is, what helps them be organized. And so uh, Trello has been a, a, an interesting tool that we've used to put the cards up and move things in different yeah. buckets and things like that. So, uh, I really- so you have like a Kanban board, like the Kanban board where you can move it across. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Um, we start ours. One thing that we do that's kind of fun uh, as we do ours at 8.06. Uh, so we have one, we have a manager team meeting and a full team meeting. So we, we start one at 8.06 a.m. on Mondays and the other one at 8.36 a.m. And for some reason that I always, every new person is like, why 8.06? And I'm like, because it gets your attention. So now I just need a cool name to match that. It will be good. It does. And well, and um, the first thing I thought of when you said six was uh, the military backgrounds that I know you have in some of your staffing of, of yeah. having your six so it just you know um dang it i wish that was the reason <laughs> that'd be a way better reason hey call me anytime i'll give you some quirky names um there you go you know besides our staff meetings i also have one-on-ones with all of my staff each week uh, anywhere from 30 minutes to 45 minutes um and that's their time we don't i don't necessarily run down their task list and get status or anything like that that's where They bring something to me, whether it's career development, helping them find a mentor or coaching them on different things that they've got. Mm -hmm. So I'm very diligent about keeping their one-on-ones every week. And I also have the same with my management. So how many one-on-ones do you have a week then? Like five or six, Um, something like that? It's gotten beyond my direct reports. Um, So any given week, I probably spend six plus hours in mentoring coaching whether it's my direct reports or some others within the business yeah it's so weird that's not weird but i think that's something as you're rising up to manager at least for me i did i I under i underestimated the volume of meetings i would have (laughs) that were just getting other people on track or helping other folks like i knew that would happen of course as a manager but suddenly you're you know 
20% of your week fills up with just like helping others get on track because that's the best way you can spend your time. And I've noticed the trend of good managers tend to spend their time that way. Um, it just seems like a common thing. You have to give your time away, which is a great part of being a manager, I guess. You really do. You, it's, um, I find it that you shift your time. So when you are an individual contributor, you are dedicated to completing the tasks, to moving the project forward. And then as a people manager, your tasks change and your your business is moving people forward, not tasks and projects mm -hmm. forward. And yep. whether that's your direct reports or other people in the business, and sometimes that requires you moving people above you forward, um, getting them more in tune with what you're doing so that they can make um, more in tune decisions. Now, I know like every security program, compliance program, there's kind of this mix of direct compliance or security managers, then you have all of these influencers. So you might have engineering, other leadership, other departments even that you have to, you know, either help them understand what they need to do or get them on track or whatever it might be. Do you have standing meetings with teams outside of your direct org, org as well? I actually do. I have um, one-on-ones with all of them. So all of my influential people within the business, business areas, business leaders, stakeholders, whatever kind of term you want to put on there. I have mm -hmm. monthly meetings with HR uh, and in regards to their compliance and how they influence our certification and compliance maturity. I meet with engineering leadership. Uh, we have standing meetings weekly with op control operators to make sure that they're on block. There's no mm -hmm. um, uncertainty as to what's expected. Uh, I meet with legal on a monthly basis, I meet with um, product management uh, in the technology business that I'm in right now. So, yeah, yep. I have standing monthly meetings with uh, even customer facing teams uh, to understand what customers need from a compliance standpoint. What are customers asking? Are we meeting their expectations? Um, you know, for I'll give you a perfect example. We weren't publishing uh, uh, in our public facing website our SOA, our statement of applicability for ISO. Mm -hmm. And uh, we kept getting requests. I mean, like half a dozen plus a month. And they'd have to come to me every time. Hey, can we have this? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's not NDA. It's, you know, it's nothing special. Sure. It says yes, no. Yep. Um, but it's, you know, getting that understanding and, and coaching and making sure that they can um, stay in alignment and help your maturity posture as well. Yep. I think that's another thing people forget is that like the compliance role. Uh, I'm on this kick right now thinking about security org structures and uh, we're, we're, I'm about to do a presentation on, on some of that. But one of the things I'm coming to realize I'm trying to articulate is that security isn't a department necessarily. You know, it's, it's really this um, this cross-functional kind of, you have to have champions across the business for it really to work. And that's probably true of any major function. I'm sure there's CFOs right now saying that's the same thing. <laughs> but for security, like there's the core team, maybe security, maybe compliance, but then you can look into HR or you can look into finance or your product. You got to have champions in those groups that are going to, you know, make sure security is top of mind and keep doing what you need to do. Let me ask you something. Did you, walking into this job, how did you accumulate all those meetings? Did you did you did you just do them over time and like this is a need need to schedule it or did you have a game plan like day one I need to reach out to stakeholders and get stuff going? It became apparent kind of early in my career how important people's understanding of the whys that we were doing mm -hmm. the, the things that we were doing or we were asking them to do different things, whether it's you know the auditors asking for something in particular, a certain type of evidence, but. That's not enough. That gets you in an audit mindset. It doesn't get you into a security mindset or a compliance mindset. And so I took it upon myself, okay, if I can just bridge this gap, help them to understand the whys behind what we're doing, they become invested in the messaging. They become part of the solution, not just part of the evidence trail. Yep. And so we, I don't call them champions, but but yeah, it's it's always continuous education helping them to understand the whys. I always walk everything. I don't speak to people in control language. I speak to them in risk language. And yep. they understand 
and I relate it back to common everyday things like locking your door. You don't leave your door unlocked. So why do you leave your, your computer unlocked when you leave the room? And that kind of don't, you know, that kind of thing makes the light bulbs go off. And so I consciously decided to expand my circle of influence is what I call it. Yeah. One thing, uh, one of the services that we do outside of like compliance and audits is we do this thing called virtual CISO services. So uh, what we do is when we come into an organization, trying to figure out like a standard methodology to build a security program. So that's like, that's what I've been thinking about the last few years. And uh, one of the things that we've come upon, we've been doing this for a couple of years now. It's like the very first thing we do is we'll make this list of stakeholders and a list of system components. And the list of stakeholders is anyone who might care about or be able to influence or have skin in the game when it comes to the security program. And then reaching out to them to begin building relationships or maybe making standing meetings or at least like have an inventory of who matters. And that has been, uh, that was really a game changer for us because early on what would happen is who, who would come in to purchase the services from us was, uh, you know, CTO or CIO. They would uh, want some objective, let's get a certification. And, and then we couldn't get traction because we didn't have the right people. So tell them that CIO, CIO, hold on a second here. I need to know the other 10 people that might care about this and then doing like an orientation session with them, setting up some standing meetings. That, that was a really big deal. So when I hear managers like you say, hey, I'm trying to expand my sphere of influence, that's like, yeah, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. And that's probably why you're having some success <laughs> knowing a little bit about your program. But that's probably what it's all about. It's not, you know, we have the best tools. It isn't, you know, anything except for just a lot of talking. And it's all about people and getting people on the same page. It really is. And it's, it's one of the bigger challenges um, that we face. And, and one of the reasons um, ultimately that I like staying in the GRC related space and, and security related spaces is it's no one thing. It's no one department. Your security team isn't the only thing that influences your security. Your risk management team isn't the only ones that influence your, your risks. Um, it's really spanned across all of the organization. Everyone has a little bit of a role to play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we frequently hear security is everybody's job. And it's really true. Um, whether you operate a control or you're within a business unit that are trying to manage your risks. I mean, people often don't equate background checks to security. But there's a lot of things to glean from a background check. And so they don't see the connection between that or... Uh, accepting a business conduct, um, you know, tying those due diligent acts to what people don't automatically think of when they hear security. They hear security, they think yep. passwords, they think patching, but it goes beyond that, even into physical security. Um, so it's it's always something challenging, and I always find it rewarding to to get people to understand how much of an impact they truly make in an organization just by knowing a little bit more. Yep. So when it comes to security and compliance, I've always found that as you become a manager and, and an executive, like the business savvy quickly becomes more important than the technical or security savvy. So one thing I'm thinking about with with folks like you ha who have a significant size team, significant complexity, is there had to have been a point where you made the decision, hey, I need more people or I need tool sets, I need resources. And asking for money and people and resources is, I think, an, an unnatural motion for, for a lot of people, mm -hmm. especially the first time around. So... How did you, what was your process to make that business case and ask for resources? Yes. Was it? It's never comfortable to say, hey, I need more money. Um, that's never a yeah. comfortable conversation to have with management. I think it's going back to the metrics and showing the value of what you're already achieving and then tying it to what you can achieve if only, right? If yeah. only we had this, this tool to streamline our process, we could identify, remediate quicker. If we had one more person, we could expand our scope and give our customers one more thing that they are asking for. We could um, mature our compliance model. And so it's really tying 
to what speaks to the value add of that um, thing that you're asking for, whether it be a tool or a, a headcount. Yeah, I think there's like, I think but we have like this burden of knowledge. Like, you know, if you do this thing, it's going to solve this problem. So sometimes you skip the this problem piece, not you, but a person might skip a, this problem thing and go straight to the solution. So I need this tool or I need another person to help me out with this. But what I've found is focusing in on that business objective or the problem that's solving, just like you said, helps frame it up a little bit. And then you can put a business case around that. And what do you, have you, has your, are you putting together like formal presentations on this or is it a lot of side conversations, meetings before the meeting? What What's the process there? A little bit of both. It depends on who you're presenting to. Um, all, it's important to know your audience, um, mm -hmm. whether it's a senior vice president, executive board, right? How do they consume information? How do they make decisions? Some of those need presentation, nice graphics, uh, projections, percentages, other they want to have a com more of a, a conversation over coffee and be able to ask you pointed questions back and forth. So it's really mm -hmm. kind of doing that, that study of who am I speaking oh, yeah. to? How do they learn? How do they make decisions and try to play to your audience? Yeah, that's, I, I also found that's absolutely true. 100%. The other thing that is important is uh, understanding your company's procurement process. Um, because a lot of organizations like, especially young leaders, you, you may not have asked for a big line item before. So there could be budget season that you have to be conscious of. Uh, you might need to know terms like this is a capital expense versus an operating expense. Uh, there might be a form you have to fill out depending on how big the organization is. So sometimes just taking a step back and being like, who are the people? Like, how do they prefer to be spoken to? And, and how can I hear from them in a way that makes sense from them? Uh, and then what's the procurement process is, or, or the budgeting process or whatever that might be uh, is interesting. Uh, how do how do y'all do budgeting? And, and let me, I'll ask it this way. So I've seen uh, one of the challenges of security is sometimes you have your own budget, which I would say in some ways is easier, but sometimes your budget is just a little bit of everybody else's budget in terms of tools. Like for example, where does the vulnerability management tool fall? Is that a security budget or is that an engineering budget because they use it? So do you maintain your own or is it kind of a hybrid? So it, it varies, right? So each department kind of has particular ownerships that they have. And then um, you acquire budget for particular needs. Pen testing is, is an excellent one. Um, yeah. That has kind of bounced around the org um, as to who owns third-party pen testing. And it's, it's landed back in the security org and they're running it now. But anytime you add a new... Um, you expand that scope, they have to go and ask for more money because they don't um, ask for it up front. They rely on the input of, of multiple business units as to what needs to have that third party yep. attestation. And so it really varies uh, as to what the solution is or whatever. But, you know, budgeting's hard and you have to, again, you know, understand how your organization runs, when your budget renews, how your budget renews. You know, from a compliance professional, some models expense that back. So if I'm looking at an engineering or a product um, for their compliance and I have to have a third party attestation, sometimes I charge that back to their business unit. Other times I consume that expense myself um, in, in other forms. So understanding your, your company's procurement process and your budgeting needs and everything, that's almost an art in and of itself. Uh, you won't yeah. need a minor in accounting to, to get through some of that in, in some of the larger organizations. Yeah, I, I think that's becoming the theme now that I think about it of our conversation today. Because if you're, if you're a security practitioner and you're early in your career, brand new, and you think what you're about to enter is pen testing. But listen, what we've talked about so far is compliance, building teams, <laughs> managing teams, budgeting, board presentations. It's like when you get to a, ma a manager or leadership level, it's not technical anymore that those are all the skills that you need, which is very business oriented. And there, so there's just no escaping it. I feel like if you get uh, high enough in an organization, it's like business acumen and people. Uh, I even have team, guys on my labs team who, uh, you know, technical of the technical, you know, but 
where they where they could do a great project, do everything right, find all the right vulnerabilities. And then what really makes or breaks the project is their ability to communicate those issues to the stakeholders so they'll actually do something about it. Right. In a way they accept. To do with their technical ability. Um, you know, I think people underestimate public speaking and presentation skills. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's overlooked in the realm of security and even um, compliance, GRC type For sure. realms. 100%. Um, last thing I want to talk about, because I think you do a good job here and other struggle is because you manage so many compliance frameworks, I have found uh, that you are good at managing the auditor, which is another art, I would say, because there's this uh, very careful relationship with an auditor in that you have to have independence. You want a good relationship, but there's probably an arm's length relationship at times. Um, you want to be cordial, but professional, you know, there's like this whole weird dynamic of managing the auditor. And I've seen, uh, I think in the worst case scenarios, people get really, really nervous, you know, and, and the audit, they pull their hair out cause they think the auditor's there to get them. And then I've seen the other side where your BFFs of the auditor, you get too close and then you, you say things that hurt your organization just because you're being silly or something. So what's your approach? How are you managing the auditor and, and managing that relationship? It is a, a little bit of a balancing act, um, you know, approach it in, in similar fashions that I do other things is, you know, having a good trust relationship with the auditor is is vital. Um, if you become defensive, they become very offensive. Um, and mm-hmm. so, you know, there's a little bit of trick trick to trade there. Um, I, I like the auditors to be honest with me and I'm honest with them. I want to know what they find um, because to me, my job is to find it before they do anyway and fix it. So if I missed it, I need to know about it. And yep. so I I really like to build a partnership with them because that's how I look at the auditors. You know, when, when the auditing first started during Sarbanes-Oxley time and when that came up, it was a really hard time to to have a relationship with your auditor. They were very standoffish. Everyone was nervous, both the auditee and the auditor. The auditor was worried they weren't looking hard enough and the auditee just didn't know how to take anything. And so, you know, I think it is a partnership um, because, you know, we we set up these controls, we operate them, and we rely on the auditor to help us validate uh, our maturity set. And so I really value their job. I understand what they're there to do because I've, I, I hired them to come in and, and take a look at my stuff, right? Um, yep. So I really just try to partner with them. I try not to see them as a gotcha. Um, I share things with them to a level that I need better understanding to make me mature my programs out. Um, but, you know, I always tell my team, we have to be of a dual mindset. We have to think like the auditor will before they come in and while they're here. And we have to, you know, think with our internal hat as well. There are things that we're going to know that the auditor is not going to know. There's things we say in the background that the audit we don't say to the auditor. Um, mm-hmm. And that's a little bit of an art. You're right. Awesome. Well, Joel, thank you so much for, for coming on today. Your wealth of knowledge and leadership and appreciate you sharing that. If you guys enjoyed this podcast, enjoy content like this, we bring on security and privacy professionals, GRC professionals like Jewel, sometimes business owners. You can check out our podcast, Tuesday Morning Grind, on any of the popular podcast apps. You can also check out our channel on YouTube and just uh, search for Risk360. We have a lot of videos just like this. And if your organization wants to build, you want to assess or you want to certify your security or privacy program, you can uh, reach out to me or you can check out Risk360 at Risk360.com. Thanks, Jewel. Thank you.